we're delighted to welcome Ruby Almeida. Ruby is a Catholic Indian woman and LGBTQ plus member. She's a former media lecturer and chair of Quest UK. And Quest, we're delighted to say, are with us today. This is a pastoral support for LGBTQ plus Catholics. And Ruby is also not, sorry, she was formerly chair of Quest, and she's now current co-chair of the Global Network of Rainbow Catholics and a founder member of Rainbow Catholics India. With typical modesty, she just describes herself as always striving to create strength and unity for the marginalized, amongst the marginalized. And she's going to speak to us now about inclusivity at what price. Ruby, thank you so much for being here. I'm on, I'm on, wonderful. Um, how do you follow James Allison? For goodness sakes, your billing was terrible. I should have been on first so everyone can forget me. And I'm on last. Well, not quite last, but well. Um, you know, starting with Mary McAleese and everybody else, and then James Allison, and then me. I take a deep breath. Uh, oh, it's all false modesty, don't worry. <laughs> um, Listen, I'm absolutely thrilled, thrilled to be here, to be part of this amazing, amazing gathering of all of us here uh, in England, around the world. And, you know, well done for all of you for organizing this. It's just phenomenal. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Uh, and also see all the other groups with their, their um, stalls here, you know, representing the different facets of what it is to be a Catholic to be a human being, uh, and all the, th all the things that we represent. Um, so I just need to say that I'm actually in awe of these amazing people who have already spoken before me, you know, from the Catholic world, these huge iconic figures who, for me, have just contributed so much, you know, that's been thought-provoking uh, and really got me thinking and scratching my head and thinking, wow, I didn't know that, or I need to look that up, I don't understand. And that's wonderful, isn't it, when, you, when you're challenged, uh, when you hear someone talking, and certainly I've been challenged. But I also need to say that they cast this massive shadow, um, and it's not a bad shadow, by the way, it's a positive shadow, because we are all um, inhabiting a world where you know, there's, there's this kind of uh, really strong sun that's scorching the earth and scorching our spiritual lives. And I think what they offer us is, is a kind of refuge with that shadow which gives us protection, which nurtures us and gives us strength and time to think about what's being said. And most importantly, they offer us ways to articulate those difficult uh, things that we're going through, that we're experiencing, uh, and, and trying to find ways to navigate that landscape. Um, what they also do is they give us insights and show us a way of going forwards, you know, on that long and winding road and trying to take, take it step by step. So, um, I just want to read you something, um, and it's a quote, and you probably know who it's from. Um, the purpose of this synod is intended to inspire people to dream about the church we are called to be, to make people's hopes flourish, to stimulate trust, to bind up wounds, to weave a new and deeper relationship, to learn from one another, to build bridges, to enlighten minds, warm hearts, and restore strength to our hands for our common mission. Anyone guess who that is? Pope Francis, indeed, indeed, <laughs> not me. Um, we must personally reach out to the peripheries, to those who have left the church, those who rarely or never practice their faith, those who've experienced poverty or marginalization, refugees, the excluded, the voiceless, etc. Some of the suggested questions the Vatican asks us to consider are to whom our particular church need to listen to, and I shout loudly, us, 
listen to us, okay? And how are the laity, especially the young and, the, and women, young people and women, listened to? Well, my dear friend, long gone now, a wonderful missionary said, wherever you go, okay, listen and hear and watch, don't speak. In other words, keep your eyes and ears wide open and your mouth shut. I wouldn't want to be that rude to the Vatican and the hierarchy, but maybe that's what they need to do, is to actually hear what we have to say rather than telling us what we already know and don't need to know from them. Okay, so what is this space? Okay, sorry, this is the Pope again. What is this space? Okay, where the voices of the minorities and the discarded and the excluded, where is that? Do we identify prejudices and stereotypes that hinder our listening? How do we listen to the social and cultural context in which we live? Okay, so I'm here to talk to you for a few minutes uh, about church and how we can learn to be inclusive. Um, how we as a community, community can learn to be inclusive, how we can as, as individuals learn to be what we want to be, what we need and what we demand from the institution of the church. We want it to be inclusive. I will sometimes use the word I, me, or you interchangeably to mean us. And I will also be referencing, or I would like you to reference that, the clergy of the hierarchy. So there's a challenge, isn't there, about inclusivity. You know, do we want the church, the institution, to be inclusive, or do we want to be inclusive, and do we want to use that as a model for the church to copy us? Okay. So a few days ago, I was the chair of the Embracing Diversity panel, and James Allison was on it, and a few other very delightful people. Uh, Claire, who's here, was on it as well. Um, and they offered insightful and challenging information. Um, fingers crossed that I, too, might be able to hit some of those marks today. Um, Nantanda Hadibi's reference was to the vib vibrancy and diversity and to the, all the contributions, sorry, a diversity of the world and the flora and the fauna and the wonder and the awe of God's creation in all its unique and dazzling differences and beauty. And of course, each one of us fits into that, that kaleidoscope, that incredible kaleidoscope of God's work. And it was actually James Allison who mentioned at the end, uh, at some point, well, the, the, the essence of what he was talking about was the we and the I, and how the many eyes make up the we, the collective we. How can we see the I and the we in the other? Because there's always the other, isn't there? Within any group that we've got, there are those who are marginalized or on the periphery or excluded. So who are they and how do we recognize them? If I may take up a little time, I'll talk about cultural practices and how they change over time. British society, and sorry for those who are in other parts of the world uh, listening in, um, let me just talk about this, and I'm sure those references can be made to your own uh, cultural um, um, landscapes. So British society has learned to embrace the difference, different foods and cultures of the stranger from the other. It has learned to eat food differently, to eat with their hands, not with just fork and knife. It has learned to share a pizza and a bowl of nachos and not just to order the personal individual steak and chips. I'm creating a stereotype. You know, go with me. Go with me on this, please. Okay. Um, I'll give you an anecdote. A very, very good friend of mine um, used to say how she vigorously safeguarded her portion of food uh, in what she called the dog-eat-dog mentality growing up in her hard knocks of life upbringing. They, they were from a poor family, a uh, very uh, dysfunctional family. The father was an abuser. There was very little money in the house, and there were four kids, and the mother would scrimp and save and equally you know, portion out their food, and they would not share. That's what she was brought up with, difficulty. So 
She gets to know me, good old Indian. I say, come for a meal. And the Indian context, you order lots and lots of food and everybody shares it. That was a big mindset for her to get used to, this notion of sharing. I lived in uh, Egypt for two years, and uh, you know that traditional way of having to sit around a big plate of food, a big round plate, equally sh portioned out food, which you share. This isn't working, is it? This is working. I'm going to take this off. Um, and um, ooh, that's better. Um, and the joy of sitting around a table and communing and sharing food and talking and celebrating about the experiences you have is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And, you know, similarly with tapas and meze, you get those examples of equality through sharing. I'm going to tell you another anecdote. Please bear with me. Um, a dear, dear friend of mine, Suresh, high caste Brahmin, you know, was the eldest, was going to inherit everything, walked away from it all, didn't want to know anything about it. And he spent his life, not quite as a sannyasi, as a holy man, but he worked with the poor, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the voiceless. And he, uh, and I worked on a production with him many years ago in, in, in the forests in, in the north of India. And we had a troop, it was literally uh, a crew of about 20 people in jeeps, convoys, where we'd go. And so there was a big crew. And here's this man who's working on projects where there's very little money. I gave up my time to go and work there for free. And he would make sure that every person there was served food. And that was his policy that he was as equal as they were, even though they were the, per, per, the, um, um, the paid workers, the crew, the staff, but he made sure everybody was served food every day, and then he sat down to eat. And for me, that was that real sense of, he, I mean, he was, a Muslim, he was a Hindu, but that was the essence of being a human being. For me, that was Christ in action. And that was wonderful to see. He totally trusted in the universal God, and he believed in Mother Earth and Mother God. And he believed that whatever he did in life, wherever he went, God was guiding him, and that he was always going to be in the midst of equals, because he sought them out. He was an equal to whoever he was with, not with the high caste Brahmins, but with the ordinary, everyday people who he saw as God. Um, I learned a lot from him. I learned his wisdom and I learned his generosity of heart. Okay, so, um, bum, bum, bum. if we could have a look at some slides, please. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk about church, you know, the institution of church, or maybe it's the community that we are. I mean, we're all meant to be church, aren't we? We make up the church. Um, so the rarefied, rarefied church, let me do it that way. Um, you know, it's, it's us, it's the individual, it's I, and we shut everything else out. Okay, it's judgmental and it's excluding of the other. How many churches like that do we know? How many institutions like that do we know? where I matter and us here matter. Okay, so, can we go on to the next one, please? Okay, this is the welcoming church. This is a church that says, come on in. You're welcome, sit down, but listen to us. We don't wanna hear what you've got to say. Listen to us, we've got all the answers for you. Okay, boy, do we know some churches like that. Okay, they are not bothered to know you. They don't want to get to know you. They want you to become like us. Next one, please, thank you. Okay, then we have the accepting church. Okay, we'll love you. Okay, you may be the sinner, but we love you. We don't like your sin. And I mean, what is sin after all, except that we're not quite hitting the mark? Okay, there's a possibility we might hit that mark. 
I don't know what that mark is meant to be, but you know, because of us as human beings, we are constantly striving to become better people, different people to evolve. But there isn't this idea of what is the perfect person. And I think too often the church tries to tell us what it is. And I think we need to try and get away from that. Okay, next one, please. Okay, the inclusive church. This is the we. It leads by example of God's love for everybody, welcomes the gifts we have and makes them, meaning the outsider, a part of us. And we're now equals. Okay, maybe that's the kind of church we're trying to strive to, towards. Okay, so, I've done that, I've done that. Okay, so I just wanted, yes, yeah, so, okay, I've lost my place. Okay, so as a society, we adapt. Okay, we learn to enjoy cultural appropriations of the other. We love the music, the dance, the fashion, the food, the hairstyles. We love all of that. You know, that's what makes us this amazing cosmopolitan society that we live in. But how much do we embrace the person who represents those cultural appropriations that we have? How much do we understand the outsider you know, the modern-day lepers, those who, you know, the Hansen's disease sufferers, the marginalized, the refugees, the trans people, the people with HIV AIDS, the gay person, the disabled person. How much do we reach out to understand and accept them as part of us? That's our challenge. Right, so then we have this idea of sharing bread not the separate individualized pieces of bread, but the actual breaking and sharing of bread. That one loaf that we have, which is probably more than we need, are we able to give that and share it with others? Are we able to accept that actually being generous is part of being Christian? Or do we just hoard everything for ourselves, you know, to accumulate and accumulate at the expense of the other? And I guess I'm asking, and you know, it was mentioned earlier, do we just pay lip service to our Christianity? And if we do, what are we really afraid of? Is it the loss of self-identity? Is it the fear of the unknown? Having to give up some of our own inherited privileges, whether we be white, male, of a particular class, a dominant culture, or of a perceived status? What we know and what we learn about who we are is invariably what we have been taught by our parents or by society, and which more often than not teaches us to be that self-sufficient, self-reliant, self-absorbed individual. So the question I'm asking about is inclusivity. At what price? And there is a price to be paid, and it's a big price. But let me assure you that the benefits for the price being paid are huge. They're countless. Those benefits, those riches about the kingdom of God is about the right here and now. I'm going to tell you another anecdote. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I used to teach for many, many years. Um, and as, a, you know, I kind of... In my leadership role, one of the things as a teacher was to always educate and empower students to understand new things and new ways of growing. Uh, so that, you know, they learned through maturity about problem solving. The knack was always to tell the student that they had come up with the idea or the solution when all along you were planting the idea in their head. So the joy for me was not to say, I told you so, but to see that person grow in self-confidence and becoming a critical thinker. And certainly in the LGBT world, I've had more often than not faced resistance to whatever role I had, sometimes from men, sometimes from straight women, and from gay women. But resistance to the work at hand, okay? And what is that work that we do, okay? Um, for me, the biggest lesson that a student had to learn was this idea of not being precious. 
okay? It was the work that mattered, the work at hand that mattered. It wasn't about the ego and it wasn't about the self. So the work that we all do on social justice has always got to be about the community that we serve. The drive has got to be to empower members from the community to take up those leadership roles and for us to not speak on their behalf. We cannot and must not disempower people. And after all, isn't this what we continually accuse the church of? I'm, I'm getting there, don't worry. Um, um, so how do we get away from those power structures that hold us back? Can we not find ways to be more, more authentic, more generous, more giving, to do unto others what we would like them to do to us, for us? So, just want to make this point. Samuel Wells recently wrote about the notion of an inclusive church, and this is a really important point. He said, we're too fixated about the outsider rather than about the, where the community needs to go, okay? So we worry, we worry about, you know, being uh, overwhelmed by refugees, by, by, you know, people begging on the streets. We're always worried about the other, but we're not concerned about where we are and where we as a community need to go. And it's that old question, you know, pointing the finger of blame at the other always has three more fingers pointing back at us about what is our fault. Where, 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 can, where have we gone wrong to correct our, our direction again? Okay, so it's never about where are you, the stranger, coming from, but actually it's about where we where are we going? What and how do we create that heaven on earth? Okay. If we think we can be transported to heaven when we leave this mortal coil, then surely the kingdom of God should be modeled here and lived out now. We need to act like Christ did when he walked this earth, to welcome the stranger, to accept and nurture differences, there's no point expecting to travel with all our prejudices and our weaknesses to those pearly gates and expect to be let in. And God forbid that we do manage to blag our way through those gates. How on earth do we expect to fit in to such an alien way of being where we are not the important person, but the other is, and the other is the community, an inclusive community? Can our fragile egos work with all those different ways of thinking and behaving and being? Can we, can you, can I model, can I be the model of the church that we want the hierarchy to be? I'm just going to leave you with this. What do we do next? Where do we go from here? How do we do it? And I'd like to challenge, throw down a challenge to you. I did this several years ago. Um, um, New Ways Ministry had this thing called Next Steps Ministry, where at the end of the weekend, you make a promise to yourself, and you say, I'm going to do this, whatever this is. It's not prescribed. You decide, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do it in six months' time or in a year's time. And we can all do that. We can all do this one thing to make that journey to change our church. Because collectively, it's amazing the power we have. Individually, we can't do it. But if each one of us is chipping away at that edifice, you know, that dam is going to break, okay? And change will happen. So have a think on that, folks. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.